my friends, what we're not going to do, I just want to start off with, with what we're not going to do is not notice this. It's the day after washing my hair and I always find this day is like the absolute worst. So like, with it's not here. I'm back at you with another video. Um, I've been requested this quite a bit, um, but it's so long, so complex and so detailed that it's it was literally impossible for me to fit in a TikTok or like have it not so many parts. And I think as you can guess by the title, we're gonna be talking about the Judd Rotenberg Center. What is it? Why is it so bad? Why do autistic people and disabled people hate it? And just the history of it all. I just wanna give a quick trigger warning, content warning. Um, there will be mentions of abuse, um, particularly to disabled people. Um, I can't really think of much else, but it is like quite a heavy topic. So if you don't like that kind of stuff, then please, stop watching. So the Judd Rotenberg Centre has been the face of many controversies since its opening in 1971. This is when it was originally named the Behaviour Research Institute. The centre was set up as a school for those with developmental disabilities, emotional disorders and autistic-like behaviours. Its founder Matthew Israel opened the first centre in Rhode Island. And by 1976 it expanded to two other branches in Massachusetts and California. However, when Israel opened the California branch he didn't have a licence to operate a group residential home, nor did he have the licence to practice psychology in the state of California, nor did he have the licence to use a Aversives, which are basically unpleasant stimuli that forces a change in behaviour through positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So basically in psychology terms, it's basically operant conditioning. He tried to apply for a licence, but the state's Department of Health rejected this. This was due to the unnecessary use of painful aversives. There was also lack of evidence to show that Israel was reputable and responsible. After this, the centre was scheduled to shut down. The day after the schedule shut down, however, it got reopened as a co-op and again applied for a licence to operate as a group home and also to use aversives. Through the help of the California governor at the time, Pat Brown, who, by the way, the law firm was actually hired to represent the centre. The centre received the licence, as well as the only ever permit granted by the state of California to use aversives in a group home. The centre was also awarded $35,000 a year per child by the state. This is the highest rate of any community facility within California. However, after the death of a resident in 1981, the state launched an investigation. This investigation showed various types of abuse, including physical and psychological. Residents were beaten, restrained, humiliated, and not adequately cared for in general. Due to this, the institute was banned from from using physical aversives. They're also banned from using restraints and withholding meals as a punishment. Israel was also banned from entering the facility. The Institute wasn't doing well in Rhode Island or Massachusetts either. As early as 1979, New York state authorities published two reports where many signs of physical and psychological abuse were present. Alongside this, in 1993, a department of the Massachusetts government, I don't want to say the name of it, um, I think you can kind of tell what the name might be. It's got a slur in it, basically. However, they said that the school had repeatedly failed to comply with a number of state regulations and threatened to take away its certification. In 1994, the centre changed its name to the Judge Rotenberg Centre. This was to honour the memory of the judge who helped to preserve the programme from extinction at the hands of state licensing officials in the 80s. The centre then moved from its original location in Rhode Island and moved to Massachusetts. Throughout its history since it was founded in 1971, there have been six residents who have died there from preventable causes. I've mentioned how the centre uses aversives and several punishments and how just poorly they treat their residents in general but it's actually a lot more severe than anyone would ever think of. The centre uses several methods of behaviour modification which by the way just shouldn't be done at all. One of these methods is ABA or Applied Behavioural Analysis. If you're a part of the autistic community you already know what this is but basically it's kind of considered as conversion therapy for autistic people. They also rely heavily on aversion therapy wanting to promote normalisation. Aversives include food deprivation, restraint, solitary confinement, and GED skin shocks. I'll get onto the GED in a bit. The centre has repeatedly claimed that all of these are just used as a last resort for when someone is self-harming themselves or becoming aggressive. However, multiple reports by government agencies have found this to be completely false. These aversives are regularly used on children, might I just stress children, with no previous actions of self-harm or aggression. And these seem to be for pretty seemingly petty things that you just shouldn't be punished for at all. As I've just mentioned, the GED is used heavily in the centre. Created none other by Matthew Israel himself, the graduated electron decelerator is a conditioning device. It delivers an electric skin shock to punish those for behaviour that's basically undesirable. Israel created the device to replace older punishments such as spanking and pinching. However, the GED would usually be used in conjunction with these older punishments that he wanted to get rid of. While the school claims its behaviour modification programme is safe and backed by science, this has been disproven many times. Alongside this, independent experts have found a lot of harm to do with the GED. This includes neuropathy, psychological trauma and third degree burns. Because of this device, the centre has been condemned for torture by the United Nations, along with the device being banned by the FDA in 2020. It's also been condemned by multiple human rights and disability rights groups, along with being involved in many lawsuits. On top of all this, it's actually been found that there's no positive behaviour programme found within the centre at all. 
resort. And although it's been stated by the centre that these kind of punishments were used as a last resort, it was used regularly, including four, but not limited to, failing to be neat, wrapping one's foot around the leg of a chair, stopping work for more than 10 seconds, closing one's eyes for more than five seconds, minor acts of non-compliance, using the toilet without permission, and also for urinating on oneself after being refused to go to the toilet, screaming whilst being shocked, and attempting to remove the device. An investigation by the FDA also found that parents and guardians were pressured into giving consent for the GED to be used on their children, while also withholding accurate information about how actually harmful this device is. Greg Miller, a former teaching assistant at the centre, reported that staff were expected to administer these shocks without any kind of concern for any harm caused. Staff were also monitored by cameras and were also threatened their jobs if they refused to administer these shocks. Residents were made to wear their GEDs at all times, including in their sleep and in the shower. Residents even reported that they were being woken up in the night due to being shocked for reasons such as wet in the bed, tensing up while asleep or breaking a rule earlier that day. They would also be shot during the day if they failed to stay away. One resident reported that they actually developed extreme insomnia due to the fear of being shocked in their sleep. Alongside the other programs the centre uses, the withholding of food is very popular and very common. Food would be given to residents as a reward for good behaviour. The centre would also give residents goals throughout the day and if they didn't complete these goals then excess food would be wasted. If a resident didn't meet their minimum calorie intake then they would be punished. They'd give them undesirable foods such as food that's been mashed up and sprinkled with liver powder which is basically used for fish bait. Another common punishment was through sensory deprivation which for autistic people if you don't know just isn't good. We already have sensory problems either being overstimulated or understimulated so like this is I mean, to me personally, this just sounds like a nightmare. This forced residents to wear a helmet that restricted their seeing and their hearing. This is through the use of white noise and this is for an extended period of time. During this, residents can also be subjected to other reversives and being restrained. At least one resident was subjected to a procedure called isolation deprivation. They will be restrained by the wrists and ankles for 24 hours. Boxes were stacked in front of them to prevent them from seeing anything else in the room. And they also received very little to eat. I think one of them was given um, lettuce and mayonnaise. They would also not be allowed to use a toilet and would be forced to wet themselves. On top of all of this, staff would be told to spray them with water every single time they walked past and would pinch their feet once an hour. Due to the sensory deprivation punishment, a resident died in 1981 due to asphyxiation and it's still being used to this day. Another program is through the use of behaviour rehearsal lessons. So basically in these lessons, someone will be coerced into performing a certain behaviour, such as eating non-food items or destroying property. This is so this behaviour can be punished. However, if the resident refuses to perform this, then they'll be punished for non-compliance. However, if they perform the behaviour that's been told for them to do then they'll get punished much more harshly. Basically throughout this there's literally no way you can't be punished. The resident is repeatedly challenged and the lesson doesn't end until they sit still perfectly for 10 minutes. I mentioned earlier how there's basically virtually no rewards program. There is but it's kind of let's say scraping the barrel very very much <laughs> because the things considered rewards at this centre include verbal praise, the opportunity to look out of a window and food. Another reward that the resident may win is an opportunity to visit the big reward store. This contained a pool table, arcade games, and it was the only place in the centre where the residents could socialise freely. I won't go too much into the deaths that have occurred here because I don't want YouTube to do a silly and take my video down. Also, I think I've already gone into too much. I think I might be like walking on thin ice here, sorry YouTube. However, usually the cause of death would be through aversives, however the centre would try and cover this up. One of these deaths, they reported that they died from natural causes, which I don't really see how that makes sense. I think just to put um, into perspective how truly horrible it is, um, one of the residents who died there was 19 years old when she died. At the time of her death, she'd been a resident at the Institute for seven years and had been subjected to 88,719 aversives. Now, I don't know about you, and I can only hope you agree with me, but there is no, I can't even, mm. there's literally no need, no circumstance where this needs to happen. As far as I'm aware, there's been about three or four major attempts to try and shut down the centre, but obviously hasn't been successful. You know what, it's really quite strange looking up this organisation when their site just literally seems like, you know, smiles and rainbows. They've also seemed to kind of put a twist on all of their very harmful behaviours. Um, they do seem to brag about the 24-7 digital recording that they have, a monitoring system to add a layer of safety and security, when really, you know, we would deserve the right to a bit of privacy. Also really funny how they talk about having qualified and skilled staff when its founder was never actually qualified in the first place. It's also really interesting, they've got a tab on their behavioural treatment. There's been, I mean, obviously there's got to be no mention of the GED, but absolutely no mention of it whatsoever. Along with minimising or eliminating restraints, which obviously, as we all know, isn't true. I think if you ever want to see how jaded an organisation or a group of people are, I think 
the Judge Rotenberg Centre site is just an amazing read. So why do autistic people not like the centre very much? I mean, hopefully through, you know, what I've said about the centre already, about their shocks, their aversives, everything like that, that's already enough to put you off. However, I mentioned previously before that they also use ABA. ABA generally is not very liked within the autism community. It's another part of their behaviour modification programme. Basically, ABA forces you to change behaviours. And you know, this therapy would be all well and good if it just wasn't being used on autistic people because autism autistic people don't need to change. There's no physical way that they could change. That's just how their brain is. That's how we just act and that's how we respond to things. And it's nothing that needs changing. And I know there's some people and parents who have, you know, given credit to ABA for how their child has now been able to walk and talk and socialize properly. But it is literally just a conversion therapy. Whenever I hear that, you're basically telling me that you weren't ever gonna support your child unless they came off as a neurotypical. And autism isn't a bad thing. I'm, I'm gonna keep saying this until the day I die, but autism isn't a bad thing. I went for ABA and I was consistently told that I shouldn't stim, I should like, I like to flap my hands a lot, I like to clap. Um, and I was consistently told that I should stop doing that. Um, and I still kind of have that reinforcement in my head to this day. Like if I stim in public, then I tell myself to stop, otherwise like, I won't get rewarded or stuff like that. So even after how many years later, it's still ingrained into me that my behaviors are wrong and I can't, I can't help that. It's just who I am. And it's, it's not something that needs to be punished. I will literally fight this corner Till the day I die, the ABA is just completely unnecessary. Alongside this, none other than Autism Speaks have partnered with the centre. If you don't already know about Autism Speaks, they are kind of portrayed as an autism rights group, but they're just an autism hate group. Consistently wanted to find a cure for autism and have consistently stigmatised and negatively portrayed autism. Where the partnership begins is through Autism Speaks' own event called Walk Now for Autism. One of the service providers at this event is the Judge Rotenberg Centre. So basically Autism Speaks are advertising a centre that advocates for the torture of autistic and disabled people. And this is on an extremely regular basis, multiple times a day this happens. And Autism Speaks probably being the most popular and well-known own autism organization worldwide it's <sighs> mm, bad so what can be done to help for everyone outside of the us there is a hashtag called stop the shock i think this is just being regularly used on twitter i'm not sure about any other social media however if you are in the us you can call the fda your state or your federal legislators and we can only hope that justice is brought to these people very soon <sighs> that was a heavy one oh my gosh hopefully you guys are okay after watching this too because i know that i am not okay <laughs> but if you like this kind of stuff then let me know because i'd really like to focus more on the history of kind of bad organizations and charities um just like the history on stuff in general it's obviously relevant to the autism community hopefully the next video will be a bit more light-hearted but this center needs to be brought to public attention because it is just so horrible also if you want to look up the center yourself because i don't know how i don't know how long this is going to be after i edit it but i've already been speaking for about 50 minutes and there's actually so much more that i just haven't included in this so if i can't even fit everything bad about it in the time that i've been recording then it's gotta be horrible but i'm gonna leave it at that stay safe stay healthy take care of yourselves um i'm gonna learn how to do an outro one day but today is not that day so um i'll see you later <laughs>